All across America, incredibly talented artisans make amazing objects the old-fashioned way, by hand. On this episode of Handcrafted America, we're getting down to brass tacks. They're so yeah. detailed, I love that. We saddle up and head to Fredericksburg, Texas to meet a woodworker who crafts rocking horses. Building them is not child's play. In Scottsdale, Arizona, I'm meeting a craftsman who transforms a simple drawing into an intricate brass door knocker. Look what it was yeah. and what it went to. And in New York, a woodworker who builds floating works of art. It's just a process, one strip of wood at a time. No detail is too small for these artisans. Is this real? Absolutely. Texas Hill Country, the mesquite tree is used to make everything from barbecue chips to floorboards. And I'm about to meet a native Texan who can turn this into a writable piece of art. It's early morning in Fredericksburg, Texas, and Alan Carr is headed to the barn to check on his horses. They're a special breed. Alan has deep Texas roots. His first horse was made from a 200-year-old mesquite tree that grew near his grandpa's saddle shop in Fort Concho. Alan played under it in grade school, and when the city cut the tree down, Alan bought it and carved his very first rocking horse out of mesquite. And why mesquite? It uniquely turns reddish brown when it's exposed to ultraviolet. Most of the quarter horses have that same beautiful reddish brown. Yeah. It takes Alan three months to make just one of his horses. The process begins with the head. Well, you start off with the thickest piece of wood in the horse, probably, and that's a three-inch block. You end up widening the ears with a separate piece that's cut out and then laminated and clamped. At that point, what I do is I just roughly draw in the cheek, and then I'll draw an angle down so that the muzzle is a full inch thinner than the top of the head. And then come in and carve the teeth, carve the which teeth. is amazing. Oh. They're so yeah. detailed, I love that. Next, he carves four legs. At this point, I call it the Trojan horse because it's got this kind of semi-finished face, head, ears, and legs. After a quick how-to, Alan hands me a grinder. I've got a couple of prominence over here that I drew in. This is going to be the top of the hip. And we also have a muscle group on both sides of the femur. So this is where you start really detailing your horse, right? Starting to put in some of the bone and muscle structure. I made a flank. Once the muscles and tendons are roughed in, Alan goes back and smooths the roughed edges to add more definition. Do you ever name these guys? I do, I do. I name them all. They develop some personality. Can I name this one? Sure. Okay, I need to you... know a little bit more. Like, what color of hair is it going to have? The mane and tail is black. Is black. Mm -hmm. I've He's got very it. handsome. Yep. Elvis. Elvis. We're working on Elvis. Okay. This is a uh, mineral oil, and what we're going to do is take this area because it evaporates very quickly. Oh, wow, look at that color. Now, what I want you to do is as I'm covering this, I want you to come up and find those little blemishes and make a circle around every one that you find. So like this right here? Uh -huh. We're gonna use a parabolic scraper rather than a flat scraper to get these marks out. A flat scraper would ruin the muscle curve that Alan worked so hard to achieve. After the mineral oil dries, Alan uses tongue oil, a drying agent, not a mouthwash, and a 340 grit wet dry paper to create a beautiful finish. I'll let you in on a little secret here. Under that beautiful finish, hidden inside the body of the horse, Alan puts a message to each of his riders. I usually sign and say who commissioned the horse. Happy trails to the countless generations of lucky riders. 
It cost anywhere from $4,500 to $14,000 to take one of Alan's horses home. This one needs a little more work before it's ready to hit the trail. Alan adds the rockers, the eyes, and of course, a beautiful mane. Wow, is this real? Absolutely. Real mane and tail. What we're trying to do now is make the second securing of that mane and tail. Okay. I'm gonna keep parting it as you're working and about every inch you're gonna drop in a shoe nail. My ping hammer. No cowboy worth his salt is gonna ride a horse without a good saddle. If I were a kid getting ready to get on this thing, this is the part that really finishes off. It really makes you feel like you're on a real horse. Alan caught on his grandfather's legacy when it came time to create a saddle for his horses. This is the famous Concho saddle that Alan's grandfather designed. I mean, this thing is absolutely beautiful. Look at the detail. And he's going to add a saddle just like this to make it rideable. In the 1880s, Alan's grandfather, R.J. Andrew, designed the famous Concho saddle. To sell his saddles, he made miniature replicas that fit on the back of a buckboard and then drove them from ranch to ranch. The surviving patterns of these salesman saddles were not only a link to a family legacy, they were a perfect fit for a rocking horse. And that really completes Elvis. Thank you so much. Thank oh, this you. is magnificent. Yeah. Really, really a treat. Well, it's been fun showing y'all how I make these heirlooms. And as Alan says, happy trails to the countless generations of lucky riders. I'm going to Arizona to meet a man who mastered his craft through trial and error. So I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning, but you just keep going. His brass door knockers are proof that practice makes perfect. A hallmark of Spanish architecture is the combination of wood and metal. And while this door knocker may be European inspired, it's 100% American made. Larry Virtue lives in the desert town of Scottsdale, Arizona. He's always been a woodworker, but 20 years ago, while traveling to Mexico, he was inspired by the beautiful Spanish architecture. The interior of Mexico is full of artsy, craftsy people, and I just really enjoyed it. And I just thought, wow, this is what I'd like to do. He decided to start a business creating clavos, handmade ornamental door nails for doors. Now, he's working with a different door accessory, custom-made brass door knockers. What are these? Those are called clavos. They're basically ornamentation. You can take a fairly plain door and liven it up, just give it some interest with some clavos and a door knocker. Larry agreed to show me how he makes his incredible door knockers. He uses a centuries-old process in his work. It starts with a pencil sketch. He takes the 2D sketch and turns it into a 3D model made out of wax. This is the way the wax starts before it gets melted. It's a carving wax that people carve jewelry out of it. But anyway, it's a little harder than like candle wax. Once it gets melted, I'll bring it over here to my form and I'll pour the wax uh -huh. in the form and make sure it's all smushed out there. Is that a technical term? The smushed is a technical term. Once this dry, then I would, I'll take the artwork and I will spray glue it to the wax. That way I can cut out the form. Now we're gonna turn on the bandsaw and I will blank it out first. Larry, need I ask why you're missing a finger? It wasn't from this saw, but when I lost this, I was in the wood business and I thought maybe I should change and do something else. <laughs> yeah, after you lose a finger, you might yeah, wanna think about yeah, a different career. I, I rethought it. First, Larry cuts off large chunks of wax. The details will be carved later with a hand tool. Do you want to give it a try? Sure. If you start here and just turn it like that, push and turn at the same time. Oh no, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Oh. Ah! Why did you tell me I was going to do that, Larry? Did she, I break it? She broke the saw. Uh-oh, I think Larry forgot to tell me not to go backwards. Luckily, he's able to repair my damage. Then, Larry shows me how to cut large pieces of wax off correctly this time. I did it! 
I only broke the machine once. <laughs> and now we're ready to carve the details into the piece. So I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning, but you just keep going like this, and then you, you get down to a finished state. There you go. So you're putting tape around it. You're pretty good at this. There is a job for me yet with you, Larry. That's right. Larry uses that same carving tool and adds all the little details that make his finished pieces so cool. We're taking our wax mold to the foundry for the next step in the process. Is there anything cooler than watching someone pour molten metal? We don't want to make it too hot. We don't want to make it too cold. They'll probably pour this at 2200 to 2250 degrees. Well, not cool exactly. You know what I mean. Larry Virtue handcrafts brass door knockers and ornamental door nails. We've already created a design and carved it out of wax, but now we need help turning that wax into brass. We'll do that with a process called sand casting, which is kind of like making a sandwich. We'll take two boxes of tightly packed sand and press them together with a wax mold in the center. Then we'll take the sandwich apart. The wax mold will have made an impression in the sand, and now our sand-casted mold will be ready for action. Now, that doesn't look like sand to me. That looks like coal. <laughs> Why is that sand black? It is sand, believe me, and it's black because of the high temperature of the metals turns it into the sand. Okay. So it turns it black. That's the wax that Larry has carved for us. Okay. And eventually, from this wax, we go ahead and make two patterns for production. Then they put a non-stick agent on the pattern so the sand won't stick to them. I can't believe that sand just stays in there. Now we have that cavity made by the pattern, whatever that pattern is. He releases the, the two-part flask. Larry's door knocker pattern, created by sand packed very tightly, is now ready for pouring. Extremely hot liquid brass has to be just the right temperature. And we don't want to make it too hot because the metal will burn into the sand. We don't want to make it too cold. Therefore, that part will misrun in the sand. They'll probably pour this at 2200 to 2250 degrees. Once the pattern is poured, the brass takes about 10 minutes to solidify. He's taken the mold over to the used sand pile and he's gonna shake out or dump out the mold to expose the casting. Oh wow, there now they we'll, are. Now we'll go ahead and tap them. Now you see the casting exposed. Excess brass pieces are cut off with a bandsaw. It's clean and we have a brass door knocker. This is the piece that came back from the foundry. Now it's Beautiful. been, it's all smoothed out. I've drilled a couple of holes for mounting and the hole that's gonna hold the knocker part. Now I'm gonna put it in this patina and it'll darken it. How long do you keep it in there? Well, we'll see. Wow, it happens so fast. When Larry wants to stop the darkening process, he takes the piece out of the patina solution and puts it in water. Look what it was yeah. and what it went to. Yeah. Now we dust the piece off to bring out the highlight in the leaves. We rub it with steel wool to remove some of the patina solution's effects and give the piece more dimension. Yeah. And you can take as little or as much off as you want. It really brings out the detail. Look at underneath all that dust, yeah. there's a shine. So how do you think that looks? I think it looks great. All we need now is the handle of the door knocker and we'll be done. Let's put this part, which is the last part. This piece would slide in there like that with another ball on this side. That is cool. Look at that. We have a door knocker. So what would this cost me? This one probably retails somewhere around 250. There's a lot of work that goes into this. Yeah, most people don't see the amount of effort that goes into the end product. They will now. Larry's beautiful door knockers are a perfect combination of style and American craftsmanship. Building a kayak one three-quarter inch strip of wood at a time. These are done one by one. This is not a panel with your two hands. Yes. This I gotta see. There's nothing more relaxing than time on the water, especially if that time is in a kayak. Now, imagine kayaking in this. 
a boat that has been handcrafted specifically for you. It's perfection. Here in Shrub Oak, New York, a town just east of the great Hudson River, award-winning boat maker Dan Thaler is making beautiful kayaks, canoes, and paddle boards. I do believe I found my passion. 10 years ago, the boating culture in the Hudson Valley area lured Dan and his wife to the water. They found plastic kayaks heavy and slow, so Dan decided to make a wood one instead. I think a wood boat is better than a plastic kayak for a number of reasons. They're prettier, they're lighter. You're buying a family heirloom that will last for generations. As soon as fellow kayakers saw Dan's kayaks, they began oaring them for themselves. Now, he customizes boats for people across the country. Dan, this is way too beautiful to take out under the water. It's probably the most common thing that I hear. It's meant to be on the water. And it's just as durable as uh, one that's made out of plastic. Yes. That's partly because Dan uses just the right wood. Generally, I use cedar. Cedar is a lot resistant. Another reason is the boat is light. It's made of skinny, tiny cedar strips. They're generally 3 quarter inch by 3 eighths. I just want to point out, these are done one by one. This is not a panel. It's one by one with your two hands. Do you customize the boat depending on what kind of water? Yeah, different models of boats are tailored for different kinds of water. Each one is personalized to the person that's going to be paddling it, so it's something that they can treasure for years and years. It can take more than two weeks to handcraft a kayak. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to put these forms onto this beam, which is called a strong back. This Go is ahead. a very straight two by four, and the length of that is determined by the boat that you're building. Most are between 16 and 17 feet, so the beam that fits inside of them is going to be about 14 or 15 feet. Next, Dan creates these wooden forms using a bandsaw and a sander. So the first thing you have to do is cut these forms out and slide them onto the beam, and they will be spaced at approximately 12 inch intervals. Are we going to glue these down? Ultimately, we will. Right okay. now, we're just going to get them in the approximate location. We're doing this because this is what's going to ultimately define the shape of the boat. And once they're secured into place, the whole thing will be flipped upside down, and the hull gets constructed. Now, we're ready to attach those thin strips. They need to be thin and flexible so that they can go around the contour of the boat. Explain to me what I'm doing right now. I don't know. Okay. I have some glue. You got the glue. You're going to run a bead of glue starting here all the way down to the other end on top of this strip. Perfect. Okay, now we're going to put the strip on. What's important is I line up that little zero mark with the form right there. We're going to squish it down into the glue, and we're going to put a staple right there. And then we're going to go to the next one. Same deal. We're going to squish it down into the glue. This obviously takes a lot of time. What motivates you to do this? It's kind of an addictive thing to do. I mean, once you've built one, and then once you've built three, it's kind of hard to stop. Before gluing each new strip, Dan lines it up against the last glue strip, looking for gaps. He uses a plane to painstakingly correct the fit before the piece is glued. And we see how much of a gap there is, and then we hold the plane like so, and then we give it a little shave along to the bottom. And we keep checking it to see that we have a nice tight joint. And then what we have here is a situation where we have to give it a little bit of a twist. So we're going to put a little temporary clip here, and we're going to get out our trusty steam iron. We're going to wet it down a little bit, and we're going to just hold it to it while we're twisting it. Cedar is nice this way because it bends really easily. You want to over twist it slightly because it will tend to spring back. Dan builds the hull and the deck separately. He mixes red and yellow cedar to create a different look. Sometimes, he adds walnut as an accent. Once the strips are in place, he takes out all the staples and sands the entire boat to remove the excess glue and rough edges. The shaping forms we added in the beginning are removed. The strips and the glue will hold the boat's shape. He then covers the boat with fiberglass and epoxy. We've already sanded these. We're going to roll out this fiberglass. You want to make sure you don't get these kind of snags when you're laying it out. But basically, it's pretty forgiving, especially on a nice flat surface like this. 
This is the resin, and this is the hardener. We're just gonna drizzle some on here. The key to getting this right is to get it even. You see the white areas there? Uh -huh. That's where there's not enough. Where it's blobbed up, that's where it's too much. You, know, you kind of have to work quickly with this stuff because right. it does set up. Because epoxy does not evaporate. If you have excess epoxy, it just adds weight. So you want to use as little as you can, but still wetting out the fiberglass completely. Finally, it's time to bring the boat to life with at least three coats of varnish. The first brush is just to get the stuff on there. The second, when you go this way, is to get make sure you've gotten all the gaps. And this way is the final brush very lightly. You're going in one direction only. That's your wet edge right there. Dan says the key is to not let the wet edge dry. This creates a seamless, beautiful finish around the whole boat. Dan's custom-built wooden kayaks range in price from five to $25,000. Varnishing takes around five to seven hours over the course of a few days to allow for drying. Then Dan adds the deck lines, the seat, and we're ready to go. Come on, Dan. I'll race you. Whoever said don't sweat the small stuff clearly didn't say it to these guys. The chiseled muscles of Alan's rocking horses the tiny decorative details of Larry's door knockers, not to mention those skinny bendable strips, each one planed and bent just to the right shape of Dan's kayaks. These artisans know by focusing on the little things, they're making the big picture that much prettier. <laughs>